Good morning and thanks for joining us here at Whiting United Methodist Church. I'm Chris Matthews and I'm glad you're here today. Be sure to check us out at whitingchurch.org where you can find information about our church for you and your family and our series, The Wesley Challenge, where we're growing deeper in our faith each day. This morning, wherever you are, whatever kind of week you've had, however you're feeling about life, Take a breath. God's spirit is with us. May God open our eyes to see today. Will you join us in worship? Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. That made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God and you're all together. Love. All together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created. All of our love's sake became poor. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, and you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. And I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. And I'll never know how much it cost. to bow down here I am to say that you're my God and you're all together lovely all together worthy all together wonderful to me I remember when a wallflower was a badge of honor, a young maiden waiting to burst into bloom. What an extraordinary time. Now coming forth wall sprouts too young to stand the test of life's poundings and unreasonable choices. Their tender leaves feeding at the speed of light. The day now a drain through osmosis the obligatory selfie, FaceTime, hashtags, pressure through Wi-Fi, downloads, and the hot breath of stirrings surfacing way too soon. Mixed emotions, 
the desire to be, the need to be sated, now, right now, this very moment, stop, stop right now, this very moment. You do not need to know it all now. You do not need to do it all now. Stop, stop right now because you were young and life is extraordinary. Feel the caterpillar walk on your arm just because it tickles. Learn to skip rocks across a lake so you say you can. Call out in a cave to feel the cool recesses echo its reply. Stop and breathe because this precious moment is yours. Youth is brief and will fade away. Bittersweet, it yields a final taste. Relish it with all the fervor you can muster. Loving and healing God, we turn to you in prayer, confident that you are with us and with all people in every moment. We stand before you as a people of hope, trusting in your care and protection. May your faithful love support us and soothe the anxiety of our hearts. O generous God, fill us with compassion and concern for others, young and old, that we may look after one another in these challenging days, bringing healing to those who are sick, bringing hope to those who may have the virus and be with their families. May those who have died rest in your internal embrace, comfort their families and friends, strengthen and protect all medical professionals caring for the sick and those who are working on the front lines. Give wisdom to leaders in healthcare and in our government that they may make right decisions for the well-being of all people. We pray in gratitude for all those in our midst who will continue to work in the days ahead in so many fields of life for the sake of us all. Bless them, keep them safe. For our students who are graduating and facing an uncertain future, give them protection. Let them know that they are loved, that they can be confident to be the leaders of tomorrow. O God of creation and life, we place ourselves in your protection. May the mantle of your peace enfold us this day and every day. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus, who taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. scared out there. We're just getting ready to reopen church soon and I would like you to get um, acquainted with my new face. <laughs> it's a little bit better for right now but that's something that you all might want to be starting to think about. Do you want to be stylish or just safe?
Our gospel lesson this morning is from the book of John, chapter 14, verses 15 through 21. The promise of the Holy Spirit. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you an advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, whom you would... That's okay. <laughs> Do I need to do the mask part over? <laughs> no, you... Our gospel lesson this morning is from the book of John, chapter 14, verses 15 through 21. The promise of the Holy Spirit. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Welcome to phase two. We've heard that term thrown around lately, and depending on where you're reading, it may mean different things. Well, here at Whiting Church, we're looking at how do we reopen together? What does it mean to, to be physically present in the coming weeks and months? We've heard from our conference that we've been given permission to reopen and gather physically beginning June 14th. But Worship may look a little different. There might be some masks. We're going to be practicing social distancing. I've even read some articles where they're recommending no singing. I'm not sure what that will look like, but we're working on a plan. We're preparing. We're getting ready for, for something new and I hope exciting as we move into this new journey together. But my friends, you know that the world is in a stressful place. That there's so many messages and so, many, so much information pouring in at us constantly. And I feel that at this time, that it's so important that for those of us who call ourselves Christian, for those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus, that we live in that spirit, that we do not fear, that we boldly walk and proclaim and share that love in this world because the world so needs to hear the love of Jesus. And so I invite you as we're preparing physically to figure out what the next part of church means. That over these next 21 days, we're going to be challenging ourselves to be in a deeper understanding of prayer, in a deeper time of questioning what it means to be a follower of Jesus. A concentrated effort on challenging all of us to be in prayer and discernment as we move forward and how, and how God is calling us to be the church. Normally when 
I spend time in school, I keep a little pedometer on my phone, and I make sure I get in 15,000 steps a day. Now, I haven't lost any weight, but I know on those school days before I leave, I feel much better if I've had those 15,000 steps in. Not only have I met my goal, but I have energy. I'm engaged in the day. I'm raring to go for another. And my eating habits aren't the greatest. There's not as much exercise as there should be. But I know when I try, when I put that concentrated effort forward, I feel better. I'm more in tune with myself. I'm more in tune with my health. And I think that goes for our spiritual lives as well. How we walk with Jesus. How we interact with the world. Way back in the day in the 1700s, John and Charles Wesley were at Oxford University, and they had a group of people. They felt the church that they were part of, they didn't feel was taking their faith seriously enough, that people were not dedicating themselves and committing themselves to a deeper understanding and a deeper walk with Christ. And so John and Charles gathered a group together, they dubbed it the Holy Club. And this group was very methodological in how they did things. Everything was planned out. They worked towards their spiritual life. They worked on accountability and questioning with each other. And they took their faith seriously. So seriously that when they met, others made fun of them and they started calling them Methodists in a derogatory term. Well, the Wesleys took that as a badge of honor. And the Wesleys had these questions, 21, 22 questions, that they would ask this holy club every time they met. And so over the next 21 days, we're going to be taking a look at these questions here during worship and online through Facebook and our website, whitingchurch.org, where I encourage you to go to find detailed questions, reflections, devotions to help us grow, to help us grow in our understanding of God, to help us grow in our understanding of how the Spirit works in our lives, to help us grow to change the world for Jesus. And so this first week, we look at these seven questions. The spiritual life, the spiritual side of the Wesleys. Would you listen as Helen shares with us in the scripture? Our scripture lesson this morning is from the book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 26 through 28. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him. Though indeed he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of our own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. May the Lord add his blessing to the scripture reading. We are God's offspring. God's creation, God's beloved children. Searching and searching, trying to find God. That God who is ever-present right before us, but we often miss. And so the idea of us focusing on these questions, of learning these practices, of exploring our spiritual life together, is time set aside, time in our lives to reflect, time in our lives to grow, time to be purposeful about our discipleship. And so these seven questions for this week from John Wesley to focus on one each day, is Jesus real to me? Am I enjoying prayer? 
Do I insist upon doing something about which my conscience is uneasy? Did the Bible live in me today? Did I disobey God in anything? Do I pray about the money I spend? Do I give time for the Bible to speak to me every day? And these are some deep questions and can foster a lot of conversation, a lot of thought. And I'm hoping that through the days we'll reflect on each one and we will take this seriously together. But for the spiritual life, I think this all falls under this umbrella of the first question. Is Jesus real to me? What is it in my life that makes Jesus real. My spiritual life. We throw that word around a lot. Spiritual. If we googled it, we'd get thousands of answers. And they'd all be probably a little different. Surveys say, Time Magazine says, this generation considers them spiritual, but not religious. We like this word spiritual. We like spirituality. But what does it mean? And so when I say spiritual, I mean the spirit, the spiritual life is our relationship with and the experience of being shaped by God into human beings we are intended to be. Hear that again. The spiritual life is our relationship with and experience of being shaped by God into the humans we are intended to be. It takes work. It takes practice. It takes noticing God working in our midst. I remember as a child, my grandparents on my mom and dad's side. Every time I saw them, they were so excited to see me. Hugs, kisses, cheek pinches. And I loved them. And we'd go on adventures, both sides. And sometimes we'd go on little overnight trips and save money. Lots of activities, and it really didn't matter where we were going or what we were doing. It was that I was spending time with my grandparents. We were spending time together. And every time they looked at me, they looked with a fullness of love. I knew my grandparents loved me. I knew they would be there for me. I knew they would take care of me. And I wonder if that's how God's relationship might be with us. The spiritual life, knowing it's going to be okay, knowing you're not alone, knowing you are loved, knowing you belong. Jesus becomes real in those times. From Psalm 39, O Lord, you have searched me, you've known me, you know when I sit down, you know when I rise up, you know my thoughts from far away, you search out my path, my lying down, even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. We know from Romans, that in all things we're more than conquerors through him who loves us. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor debt, nor anything in all creation, anything will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That love of God, that connection 
that spiritual life. And I think like my grandparents, God is always seeking, always there. We're always with us. Jesus being real. And this Jesus looks like what Paul says in Galatians 5. How do we know Jesus is real? For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I think for a lot of us, we have this abstract idea of Jesus, a concept of Jesus, this idea, maybe if we act right or we do good things, it'll be okay. Or we have this idea of Jesus that maybe we've messed up so much that there's no way that this Jesus could love us. Or maybe we've confused Jesus with this idea of legalism, this bureaucracy. Jesus is reflected in my image. Jesus looks like me. Jesus looks and thinks the way I do. Jesus would have to agree with what I have to say. And I think that's got us in a lot of issues as a church over the years. So much so that there's a generation of people that will say, I'm spiritual, but not religious. I think oftentimes in the church we've confused, I'm religious, but not very spiritual. What would it be, what would it take for us to take our faith seriously? For us to take this Jesus thing like it was real, like it mattered, like it had power, like it could change the world. Would we believe? Would we live like it was real? I think we're looking too much at our TVs in our news for the answer. And many times these days, I think we're coming up and we're not getting our questions answered. The authorities we thought we trusted, we're not sure that we can. And we don't know where to turn. Yet all the while, God searches us. God knows us. God loves us. We are his children, his offspring. There's an Anglican Episcopalian philosopher, Evelyn Underhill, and she says, but so many Christians, so many Christians are like deaf people at a concert. They can study the program carefully, they can believe every statement, they can make it in, they can speak respectfully of the quality of the music, but only really hear a phrase, maybe now and then, if at all. So they have no notion at all of the mighty symphony which fills the universe, to which our lives are destined to make their tiny contribution, and which is the self-expression of the eternal God. When we've gotten so busy in life, that we can't make time, when we're worrying so much that we have trouble just catching our breath, when we've traded the spiritual life for an empty religious dogma, we are not noticing the real presence of Christ in our midst. You say, how can I do that? I've got a kids, I've got family, I don't have a lot of time. I'm rushing day to day. And 
spirituality just isn't for the professionals. Spirituality is not being a nun or a priest or monk or some spiritual guru. But spirituality, like any kind of exercise of these practices, these practices that call us into a deeper relationship with an experience of being shaped by God into the human beings we are intended to be. Have you heard of Brother Lawrence? Brother Lawrence was not a monk. He was not an ordained religious professional. But Brother Lawrence felt God was calling him. Brother Lawrence felt that it was time to see God in the midst of his everyday life. And so he didn't go on to preach great messages, write great songs. But he entered a monastery. He said, I want to cook for you. I want to serve your meals. And so he cooked for the monks. And later, he would fix their sandals so they could walk so their hurt, their feet wouldn't hurt. And Brother Lawrence says of God, Brother Lawrence who found God in the mundane, everydayness of life. He says, God does not ask much of us, merely a thought of him from time to time, a little act of adoration, sometimes to ask for his grace, sometimes to offer him your sufferings, at other times to thank him for his graces, past and present. He has bestowed on you in the midst of your troubles to take solace in him as often as you can. Lift up your heart to him during your meals in company. The least little remembrance will always be the most pleasing to him. One need not cry out very loudly. He is nearer to us than we think. The spiritual life is about paying attention. When we work through these questions, like the Wesleys did, when we begin to reflect on our spiritual lives, how we're living in day and out, how we're confessing, how we're forgiving, how we're spending our money, we begin to notice God working in the world. Those little glimpses of God that sometimes we think we're too busy to see. I love my mama. And my mama likes to call me. And I'm often really busy. And she calls and I might be in a meeting or at work. And so I'll say, okay, mom, I'll get back to you soon. And I hit the climb. I hear a voice message, Chris, call me, call me. How you doing? So, okay, I'm going to call you, mom. And then the day goes on and I get busy and I keep going and I have trouble stopping. And it's the end of the night. And I really don't want to call mom at midnight. I'm tired. And so I waited out, and I may have forgotten she called, but I know she might call back. And probably after the third or fourth voicemail, Mom said, Chris, are you alive still? Are you okay? Give me a call. And I wonder if that's how God is with us. That God is there, waiting. That God's calling out to us, Give me a call, check in, let me know how you're doing. I want to give you everything. I want to give you this good life. I want to give you this love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. But answer my call. Answer my call. So for the next 21 days, I invite us to be intentional 
about answering God's call on our lives. My friends, it's so important. The world needs to hear, needs to experience the love of Jesus. Through us. And so I encourage you. We need people who are willing to risk it all. We need people who are willing to say, I am going to take up my cross and follow. We need people who have given up on the church to give it another chance. We have, need people who've never set foot in the church to say, I'm willing to step out in faith. We need lonely, busy, tired people. People who may be misfits to say, okay, God, finally, I'm willing to pause. I'm really to think about this spiritual stuff. God, help me to follow. My prayer this week is that as we question, as we spend time in quiet, that Jesus may become more and more real to you and to me. That Jesus may become more and more real and active in our lives. So that we may share with the world the love that Jesus has given us. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, oh, oh.